we have a long way to go though because I, I think I also think that um, women struggle to see men being vulnerable and then I think that's one of the challenges that we have in that society when a man is vulnerable and a man is emotional I don't think society knows how to handle and deal with it or how to embrace it in a non-judgmental way. This week on Great Conversations, I have the absolute pleasure of speaking to Saeed Olaiwala. Saeed is working in the resilience, social mobility and equity space. Saeed, welcome to Great Conversations. How are you today? Uh, very well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to our conversation, Nika. So am I. And we are kicking off with the most amazing question. So, Saeed, what will you tell your 75-year-old self you are proud of them for? When I looked at the question, loads of things came rushing into my head. And I, and I, and I went back to um, how, at 75, when I look back on my life, how would I want it to look? What would I be proud of? What would I be have been happy about? And it's, uh, it's, I think, proud of being able to show love at times when maybe other people wouldn't have been able to or society tells you not not to show love. Um, it's being proud of being um, doing enough, as in putting enough into the world more than uh, to try and make it a bit more better than than how I met it. Um, and putting energy into people, into my communities into my family and my children and and putting as much energy and presence as I can into myself so that I'm I'm learning, hopefully up to the age of 75 and beyond. Um, so I'd be, if I'm able to achieve those things in a small amount, I think I'll be quite proud. That's the, that's the things I'll be proud about. That is absolutely beautiful. And what about yourself? Like, what about the qualities, like when you're 75? What personal qualities would you be proud of having developed and harnessed? Um, patience. I think, I think, I think uh, I'm hoping to have, you know, cause you kind of, there's a, there's this thing, I'm not sure how true it is. There's this thing that the older you get, maybe the, you know, the grumpy old man. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm hoping I don't, I don't become that. Um, I'm hoping that I'm able to, um, have a lot of patience and to continue to share and show, show love, um, and, and presence, um, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that that lives in, in me um, through to the age of 75. They're such beautiful qualities. Like what have you, um, what have they empowered and opened up for you? So embracing patience and love like in your life so far, like what, what is it that they've given you that make them so important? So we all go through journeys, right? So I went through a, a thing, I would to my daughter now about 18 She's 18 now and, and in our in my younger years, I still consider myself young at 45, but my younger years, um, I went through some really heavy times in my relationships, um, the relationship with her mum. And and I had to go on a on a journey to understand myself. And I didn't know this was what was needed, because I always thought, you always think you've got the best understanding of yourself. You know yourself. You know, you behave in a certain way because that's who you are. And you respond to things in a certain way because that's who you are. And when I started on this journey, I realized that um I started to realize that one, um, I didn't have it was about a challenge of love for myself. Um and I, and a challenge of patience for myself. And I realized that because I realized externally what I was going through, even though I, I felt like I was showing love and I was being patient, there was still more there for me to show and for me to be. And the love, you know, when we look at love, we always see it as this thing that's like, wow, and it's all, you know, all energized and energetic, and but it's also very patient and it's also very calm and and, you know, and it can be frustrating at times as well. So when I was going through some of the stuff I was experiencing, I was I started on a journey to actually to be more patient. And I realized that first I needed to understand patience for myself um, to allow me to navigate that time of my life um, so that it didn't it didn't cause me any more pain. And so 
uh, you know, at that time when I started that journey, I, I realized a lot of stuff for myself and that, you know, I had great teachings for my mum, for my, my, my uncles, my, you know, my dad, for my friends. But you no, know, I had to start being a, a teacher for myself. I had to start teaching myself intentionally um, and, and understand that, yeah, society wants us to move towards a certain direction and it puts triggers in our way for that. But also there's a path that we authentically, we have to gravitate towards and it's always inside us. Well, it, for me, it was inside me, but I, I was fighting against it almost and I, was, I wasn't embracing it and, and, and I'm still on that journey to embracing it and holding it. So yeah, so patience and love are two things that, really really important for me because you know with patience i can not just be patient with myself but be patient with other people right um and i can intentionally show patience to a level where you know others might not understand why is he being so patient but it's because i know that a path to patience or through my own journey um a path to love is through patience um, and that's one path. And, and, and love is something that I want to put more into the world, feeling myself, but put as much as possible into the world. But that, that's absolutely stunning. And yeah, as you say, you, you know, you take the piss out of me because I'm like, all you need is love. But it's so true. And it really and I, is. It, it really is, is, isn't it? And this and this concept of of love and what it means and it was powerful when you said um, patience is the, you know, one route to love. I found that really powerful. What I also find really powerful is that I'm having or about to embark on a conversation about love with um, with a man. And it's not often something that you hear, you know, men that would advocate so openly for. And if you don't mind, I would like to explore this concept and picking up a little bit about on um, what you said about you know, what, what it means to be a man, like just in general, you know, because I can imagine when you were younger, as you said, there was lots of all these external, not pressures, but, you know, just expectations of, I guess, part of that must have been defining what it meant for you to be a man and to show up in that world. So what is something that you would like us to know about that, about, you know, being a, being a man and navigating different stages of your life in with that label attached to you? Brilliant question. I think something that society needs to create space or just like allow men to define what masculinity is. And I think that there is a, there are set, I suppose, generic characteristics that, that a man is supposed to have and supposed to be. But I think within that, um, every man is unique and individual. And sometimes society labels men a certain way. And so then we, we, when you have a label, right, you feel the need to, to an extent to conform to that, but not just you feel the need to conform to it. The whole system molds itself in a way that it doesn't give you any room to move outside of that. And then when you try to move outside of that, outside of that, you know, it's seen as, you know, it's kind of almost shut down or seen as wrong or unusual or weird or strange. You know, I was talking to a good friend of mine, um, a clinical psychologist called Stephen Weatherhead, and we were talking about exactly this, talking about masculinity and how, you know, there's a lot of message out there in the media at the moment or around that masculinity is toxic, toxic masculinity, toxic masculinity. But why are we not using words like kind masculinity? Because I have... You know, my dad has, as, as much as he might have been a, a strong man on, 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 on one, some elements, he had a huge amount of kindness to him. Um, why are we not using the words like compassionate masculinity, caring masculinity, loving masculinity, emotional masculinity? Um, because, you know, some of the men in my life, you know, my dad being a, a key figure, I've seen times when hard for him to have been emotional. You know, but I see moments when he was really, really emotional, when he felt an emotional, you know, across the spectrum. Okay, yeah, angry emotional, but also very caringly emotional as well. Um, so I think that there are, there are, when it comes to masculinity, there are so many different ways that we can describe. There are loads of fathers, uncles, you know, brothers out there putting into the world and putting into their family and putting into their community in the most positive, most kind, most compassionate, most loving, most genuine, most authentic most beautiful, most manly ways. And that doesn't always come across because, you know, 
there's this amplification of toxic toxic masculinity. I think so. For me, growing up as a as a man, yes, I had influences that you know I saw things and experienced things and and learned things that I at when I started my journey, I was like, okay, I need to remove or release some of these things. Um, some of these way of responding to situations or reacting aren't the ways that I want to respond to situations. It doesn't align with me as a person in how I want to be present in the world, in how I want to be. And I'll be honest with you, there were times when I was going through really challenging moments and, you know, I was told, well, you're, you're not manly enough. You know, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not aggressive enough. You know, as a man, you should be aggressive like this. That's what I was going to ask you. Like, I'm really interested to understand, um, like how that, how the definition of masculinity has changed and evolved for you as you've grown, as you've grown and stepped more into authenticity. But, and I think this is what you're sort of going to as well. Like when you were younger, you know, how was masculinity defined for you? And then what did that result in, in terms of the people you surrounded yourself with and, and, and the choices that you made in your life? And then how did you learn to, I guess, start redefining that for yourself? Um, so that, yeah, you could maybe live more authentically, as you say, you know, patience, kindness, love, um, but more authentically you. It's a bit of a journey. It's been a bit of a journey. I had two, no, several influences. So growing up, I came up to the UK when I was about eight. So um, the influences I had when I was younger was my granddad, when I was in Nigeria, mainly my granddad, my dad and my uncles, all different personalities, right? So my granddad, obviously, I always always saw him as calm, but I saw when he dealt with my cousins, he can be quite a, a strong disciplinarian, right? The mosque was a, a, a big part of my life growing up as well. So when I went into the mosque, I saw a mixture of stuff. The imam was was calm, very, very calm at times, but some of the some of the members of the mosques um, and congregation can be quite, you know, emotional and, and almost even um, explosive in, in dealing, again, disciplinarian in dealing with stuff. And so I had a whole mix of, of experiences um, and then when I came to um, the the UK, I had, you know, again, a different influx of what masculinity should look like through the media, through um, through the, the relationships I had with some of my some of my friends, um, through how I, how I experienced and saw society, the things I saw going on in society. So like with all of that mix, like if you think back now, what was your definition or what was the story that you told yourself around this is how this is what it means to be a man and this is how I must show up it was confusing and complex um at points it was like a man should always provide um should always like you know be out there working a man always has to be strong uh, it's got to be like you know no tears no crying um uh, you know got to be formidable you've got to put your foot down you've got to do you see what I mean at, at times and at times it was you know a man can just be silent but then that silence, you know, also can be can can be quite abusive. It's not communicated in the right way, right? I lost my mom in a, cu a couple of years ago, okay. And whilst in the in the early days I would cry sometimes, laugh sometimes, and would be okay. Um, but I didn't actually sit there and cry. And I always wondered if could I cry in front of my daughter. Right. And if I cried in front of her, what would that show her as what a man should be and how a man should be like? Right. These are the questions that went through my mind. Right. And then the other thing was, well, I want her to understand and be able to hold space and allow anyone, if she's in, whoever she's in a relationship, any partner she has to be OK with seeing that level of vulnerability. And, and there are levels to it. I think there are levels to it. Um, and one time when we were talking about my, uh, her grandma, uh, my eyes did fill up, and it was okay. I didn't fight to stop it um, because it was important for what would would my dad and my uncles have been able to or allowed to do that? Probably not. My dad, when he lost his mum, sat in the house in the room just in pure darkness. So we knew he was in pain and he was hurting, but never spoke about it. He sat pure, just in pure da darkness for days, just sat in a room for days. Um, and yes, he might have been shedding tears at that time, and he probably was, but he didn't want us to see it in that way. And is that because he's trying to protect us and look after us? 
knowing that we're feeling it as well um and doesn't didn't didn't want to put has to carry that for him or with him or feel impacted by that and and if that's the case then that's a level of protection and awareness and taking a responsibility as a man to not just what i mean but then is it what lesson is that teaching I was going to say that and that's what I think is so so powerful about um, what you said that you did because it's having that sort of thought about how is that, in, like what am I showing, what am I role modelling to, um, you know, my daughter and then as you said, what she's going to bring into her relationship. So normalising that men feel equally and deeply as much as we do as women and it's okay there's not it doesn't it doesn't lessen their masculinity at all if they embrace that emotion and it's important from a from from a female side to see that and to learn how to hold as you say to hold that space for other for other men as well we have a long way to go though because i i think i also think that um women struggle to see men being vulnerable and then i think that's one of the challenges that we have in that society when a man is vulnerable and a man is emotional, I don't think society knows how to handle and deal with it or how to embrace it in a non-judgmental way. I think part of the reason for that though, Saeed, is because we don't know how to embrace it for ourselves. It's like what you said right at the beginning is, you know, learning to, you wanted to spread more love in the world, but you had to learn to give that to yourself first and to give patience to yourself first. And and, and I feel like our capacity and what we can deliver externally is a reflection of what we can deliver internally to ourselves. And I, and I do think, I, I, I think, again, it, it's multifaceted. I think one component of it is that we are just, for all that women are given permission to be more emotional, it's still, oh, you're the emotional woman. Are you on your period? Are you going through the menopause? Like it's still dismissed and shamed, although there's permission to embrace our emotions a lot more. Um, and so I do think it's a, there's, it, it's as a collective, we are not skilled at stopping facing our emotions and then knowing how to deal with them in a healthy way. We know how to get drunk. We know how to do online shopping, gambling, to numb ourselves. But healthily dealing with it is a different matter. And I think then, like what you're saying, that bleeds over into any relationship. So then we don't know how to handle that and hold that for somebody else. Completely. I think, I think definitely you're right there. And I think, I think, um, I think society also doesn't, um, is still trying to understand what that looks like. We do look external quite a lot. It's, it's hard. I know, no, I'm not sure if you've been on a journey or you're on a journey or you just over life. It's hard to, it, you know, looking at yourself and, and seeing yourself like holding a mirror up is a hard thing to do like it's 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 because because like it's your vulnerability right you're exposing yourself to yourself there's nowhere to hide when you do that and then it's a case of okay now i know this what do i then do with it and then to to know that to, to, to be on that journey yourself but then have to whilst you're trying to figure that out for yourself then i still have to be present exist um contribute to my personal life, my work life, to society in a way that's balanced enough <laughs> to allow me to maintain my resilience, to continue my own development and growth, to support other people. It, there's, there's a lot there. And I, th and I think, and I think, yeah, it could le lend to why it, it, at times for, and I, I've been through it and I've been on that journey where at times it feels overwhelming. Yeah, of course. Being human's hectic. Because as you say, there's like so much to carry, isn't there? But you know that I I I agree with you, and I often find, and, and this is also reflective of my own personal journey as well. That that I was forced to look in the mirror when something really bad happened to me, like you know the proverbial hitting rock bottom. I had to hit rock bottom before I paused and thought, right, I can't carry on like this. Like I really do need to yeah, look in the mirror and, and make some changes. Um, was it the same for you? And if so, what was your mirror moment? I think I, several mirror moments over the years, because I, I think it's like, um, 
I, I have this thing that I think like we 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 have circles, right? Our journeys are like circles, but all the circles overlap, and they kind of can I they join along along the journey. So several mirror moments have brought about um, different revelations and 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 kind of different changes and learnings that needed to be made. I think key there are you know key big ones. You know um, obviously you know. I mentioned earlier when I started that you know my first you know family breakup that was a heavy heavy one a heavy one for me that I I, I struggled to to maintain but brought brought a lot of a lot of learning. It's one of the things that the journey from that got me into really looking at my value systems and 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 looking at like what 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 I want to define me. So what kind of values do I want? Because we get given values, right? We learn values from our parents and, you know, we learn all that type of stuff. But do we actually ever choose our values for ourselves and, and say, okay, I'm intentionally choosing these set of values to govern my life by, to live by as I continue life. And so I made a conscious decision to do exactly that. When, when your family was breaking up and you said that you started looking at, you know, your values, like, how did you even come across that? Like, how did this concept of values even enter your world as a, as a space for you to go in order to then, you know, help yourself move through that? I feel when something is not right within, I feel like you can kind of feel it. So there was all the stuff that was going on externally was happening. Things weren't right there, but in myself and in the way that I was responding to the situations and the way I was behaving or acting or reacting wasn't sitting well with me. And I always felt like there was a, a different way that I wanted to be. And I always reminded, like always, my mom was a huge teacher in my life. And now even as she's not here, she's, she's maintained a huge teacher. She always used to say, you know, um, she always used to say our lessons come from our ancestors. So she would talk about her grand, her, her dad, her mum, her uncles that have passed and the lessons she learned from them. And I, at that time, she was still around. At that time, I was, I was reflecting the way I was responding to the situation, uh, based on how my mum was, if that made sense, and what I'd seen the way that she was and the way she is. And, you know, no matter what life was throwing at her or whatever she experienced, she had this 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 patience and this love, and she 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 just had this. So I was like, okay, I felt like I wanted to 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 be that. I wanted peace. I wanted peace at most in the turmoil that I was feeling emotionally, psychologically, physically. I just wanted peace. I decided that I needed to intentionally be present in my life. And part of that intention of being present was to choose my value systems and how I wanted to exist and show up in life, right? That's the that's the base of transforming your life, isn't it? As you say, is understanding the values with um, you know, that you want to build your life around and that and then that determines the all the decisions you make, the person that you want to be. Or well, when I started to explore things in that way a lot more um a lot of people around me um were going through their own journeys but weren't they weren't there or they weren't come uh, uh, they, they hadn't they hadn't started that element of their journey or maybe they were just on a different journey which and it can feel quite isolating at times um where you kind of you know you're still quite judged or you know you feel like you're going against the grain um and it can it can stunt your your the journey because you know like we're we're connectors right we like to as human beings we like to connect we like to to be able to relate or or have that that level um so that's the that's the one thing I'll say to anybody that's like you know embarking on 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 that journey of just discovery like nobody else is going to understand completely where you are or what you're experiencing, and we shouldn't expect them to and they don't need to. Because um, we don't, we're still trying to figure it out, right? So, so, and that's okay. That kind of confusion, mayhem, whatever it is that's going on, it's okay because at the end of all that, this, <laughs> you slowly start to, you start, slowly start to see little threads that will come out, and little things that you'll be able to lean more into to build your confidence and build your position and build your values and build 
how you want to show up to not just for yourself, for the people that you love and the people around you. And, and I think that's, you know, as men, if I, I think, you know, I know a lot of men that are leaning into who they are and how they want to define their own masculinity. And I think that, if anything, that's what we need to amplify as men to to show up in the way that we are authentically. To show up in the way that we exist, you know, there's a lot of men that maybe they don't scream about it on social media or even to some of their friends, but they're there regardless for their family. They're present for their friends, you know, their male friends, their female friends. They're 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 constantly working to to be the best version of themselves as a man and how they see as a man should show up. Yeah, and and I I hate I see that as well. I I. I experience that and see that and there there are men in my life um on a very similar journey and what breaks my heart and also encourages me is the is the belief is as they're stepping more into their authenticity what they grapple with is lovability and I think it's directly linked to this concept of masculinity because it is like left of center of what we've traditionally been force fed as a society that it means like you know what it means to be a man and because they're not that because for you know for some that I know they are gentle and and really kind and sweet and caring and as you say just grounded in community and family and and um and that's how they're showing up but yet the world around them is telling them that that means that they're not manly enough which means that they're not lovable enough which means that no one will ever want them and so it is you know as you say it's it's a really um a much needed evolution um but it's um it as you I absolutely agree with you it doesn't make it easy when you're breaking out of a traditional stereotype or mold it's very vulnerable and um and really quite you know yeah, it can be very lonely as well, can't it? And so where do you go to find those people that have got, you know, a hand to hold or, you know, can just walk alongside you so that it feels less intimidating? You're, you're completely right. It's hard to to navigate that journey. And you have to find um, people that are that resonate with the, where you're trying to go, where, or where you are at the moment, where you're trying to move to. First, look locally. So... In Liverpool at the moment, there are a few projects I'm involved in that are um, supporting, supporting me, or supporting the community really, but supporting men and supporting people around health, well-being, and resilience and and social mobility. Um, so one of the first ones that I'd say, well, if anyone's watching this or anything like that, please reach out to me, even just for a conversation or a chat. If I can't help with anything, I'll try and time post you to someone that might be able to help or whatever. But we have the Liverpool Black Men's Group which is an organization set up to support, um, to, to be, to be a, to I suppose a bit of activism, um, in, in, uh, in showing and showcasing how men show up and, and how, how masculinity, masculinity is. Um, we do health and wellbeing work, um, within the community. Um, we're actually doing a project at the moment with uh, Friends of the Earth and um, the Court Bank, which is around greening and gardening and space. So we meet up and we do gardening and clear spaces and do seeding and stuff like that. And it's just an opportunity for us to connect and just, just be. So find a space like that. You know, one of the things for me that I'm, I personally think that the bravest thing that you can do is to ask for help. And I think oftentimes, you know, that's the hardest first step to take. So what are some of the things that has helped you navigate that in your life? I think that one of the things about fear when we're when we're trying to embrace in something new or on a journey is that we we almost don't want to embrace and accept the discomfort of of the journey or the experience. Right. And that creates conflict in itself. So if I know that this is a path I want to move down more, but my uncertainty, my fear, my discomfort is like, whoa, it's not quite right, or oh, I'm not quite ready, or it creates a, a, a conflict because I know I should be going that way, but I'm not, I'm staying where I am or going. So I think there's a thing in there about accepting that the journey that we're on, the change that's going to happen is a scary one, right? And it's one that can feel allow us that that we'll feel quite fearful and we accept that fear is a part of the journey 
right? So feeling scared because of the uncertain and the unknown is one element of that, Jen. So leaning into that and accepting that first and foremost. I think there's something in there about um, surrounding yourself with other people or people that might be on that journey as well or are on a similar journey, okay? That are, you know, are on that journey of growth, are on that journey of trying to be better and show up better. And you have to actively go out and look for people like that. So there's something huge about human connection. We do Ubuntu first Sunday of every month in Liverpool. Um, and whoever comes, you're always welcome. And so part of that embrace and that fear is choosing to step into the journey, choosing to step into the discomfort of that journey. And then it's how, what little tiny small steps do I need to take to help myself feel better in stepping into this? But then allowing myself the understanding that it's not going to be perfect. So usually when we, when we start this thing, we're like, okay, this is the end point and, I'm, and this is, and, and just the thought of that alone going so far forward can, can make us procrastinate, right? It can, it can scare us into freezing and standing still, right? So there's something, there's something in there about just like, okay, this is, you know, this is going to be a pretty wobbly, you know, journey. I don't know what it's going to look like, but what I'm going to do is step into it and let, allow myself that freedom, that space to learn as I go along. I don't need to be completely prescriptive as to what it's going to look like, how it's going to be, but I know I have a feeling, a sense in me that I, I want to do things differently and do things better. So I'm just going to step into that and see. It's so interesting for me how just even the advice that you've shared, the your values of patience and love just shines through everything because because fundamental to everything that you're advocating is being patient with yourself and there's um this saying that I heard which is slow is the fastest way forward and I just think that's so relevant here and that's where the patience shows up and then the love um, and the grace for it's not well this concept of perfection anyway is is a it's a word that intrigues me because um it's all about learning isn't it so you know um but it's about yeah you know lovingly being patient with yourself as you navigate the unknown because you're bravely showing up anyway and if you're prepared to take action then that for me is the most courageous thing that you'll that you'll ever do i think it's i think i think the other thing is when we hear those two words love and patience you know people tend to see it as soft right but it's also very very strong right it takes a lot of strength to be patient it takes a lot of strength to 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 you know to to patiently try to make a change in something or patiently listen to somebody that's been maybe really fr uh, you know approaching in a way that you don't want them to approach you right um so i think i think there's those are two two words that maybe people look at no oh, that's a bit soft but also the other side of it they're very 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 strong words I think they're strong because like for me, that the pa for patience for me, and, and you use this word before, but like presence, you know, there's, there's a consciousness in patience because you have to be fully present and awake to what's going on, which means like everything, as you say, listening, emotions, everything. And when you rush through life, you're not, it's easy. Like you, you are unconscious a lot of the times of what's going on. And so that in some ways is a protector, you know, a protection. Survival, yeah, survival, yeah, it's survival, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So I ag I agree with you. I think it's it's such a a, a a strong concept to be to be patient and then also to choose love versus anger, judgment, shame, whatever it might be, but to stand in love for yourself. On that note, and so I'm I'm intrigued to see what your answer is going to be to this. So I ask all my guests, what is something that other people value that you don't? I think people value holding on to grudges, holding on to anger. Um, and I don't, I don't value it. I don't, um, and I don't value it because um, it keeps from learning what I've learned over years. It it keeps me almost it's like a it's like a, a time a time stamp almost it keeps me frozen my emotions my energy frozen in a specific experience in a specific space right and that's a form of trap and there's no freedom there for me 
you see what I mean? There's no freedom for me to be peaceful, for me to be patient, for me to be loving. Um, that doesn't that doesn't mean that. So for me, I don't value holding on to um, a grudge or anger. In fact, I try to let go of them. Sometimes maybe too quickly. What I've learned over time, and I'm and I'm getting. And, but I think that's more about boundaries and holding on, holding certain boundaries. And you can, you can, I think you can show anger, but you don't hold on to it. You can show frustration, you can show disappointment, disapprovement in something, um, but you don't hold on to it because by holding on to it, it means that you you are you're stuck at a point. And every time that situation comes up, you're back in stuck in that point again. Um and there's no there's no love for self in there in that space. That's my own experience or my own my own thinking. Is that then it it it, it stunts your our ability to love, our ability to be patient, um, and just to be peaceful. I love the analogy that you just used, like this gilded cage. I had, I, it's that's really powerful. I hadn't thought about it like that. Saeed, thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your advice. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on this. I've got goosebumps finishing the conversation. Look at that. <laughs> What a fabulous way to kick off season four of Great Conversations. I adored so many things about my conversation with Saeed. I loved going into his definition of masculinity and how Saeed talked about taking some time to consciously define his values and then from that space of being grounded in his own values, defining what masculinity means for him and then from that space going into the world. And if that's something that you're interested in doing for yourself, you know, the exploring more of these concepts around authenticity or values, then please head over to integrate, www.integrate.net. We have tons of resources to help you get started on your own personal growth journey. As always, I wanna thank my editor, Stian Moritz, and musician, Jamie Jenkins, Sending you all so much love. It's fabulous to be back. Bye for now.